So previously we've had a look at the Python data model and how it's based on the concept of an object. And we've also explored text data types. So let's just recap. If we have a look at the directory of object, we get the object based data model methods. And if we have a look at the directory of string, we can see that string has these object based data model methods and it's got supplementary text-based methods. And we can see how the string is based on the object if we view their identifiers side by side. So we see the object-based data model methods are all present in the string. And if we have a look at the string's method resolution order, we can see that it's based on the object. So now we're going to have a look at numeric data types. So one numeric data type is the integer, and this is a whole number. So we can have a look at the directory of an integer. So if we have a look at the, the methods, we see that most of these are data model methods. So they begin and end with a double underscore. And if I just go ahead and reorder these, then we can see that it follows the design pattern of an object. So we've got all of these object-based data model identifiers. And if we have a look at the method resolution order, we can see that it's based on object. And recall if we use help, we can essentially get a summary of everything in the class. And this tells you essentially what built-in function or operator each of these data model methods control. And I'm just going to copy this output into the script file and I'm going to put a multi-line string in, in a list just so I can use cold folding. So here we see we've got the absolute data model method and it maps to the absolute function. And we've got the add data model method and it maps to the add operator. And there's a module called operator. So we can import it and we can have a look at its identifiers. So it's got all of the operators in the form of data model identifiers. And then it also has them all without the double underscores. So you've got absolute um, with the double underscores and then you've got absolute without them. Okay, so quickly having a look at the directory of the operator module. And previously we've had a look at the directory of the int class and the object class. So essentially you should notice that all of the identifiers in the int class are either in this operator module or they are inherited from the object class. And once again, if we use help on operator, then we're going to get a summary of all of the identifiers in the module. So I'm just going to once again copy and paste this into a list of a multi-line string so I can use cold folding. So recall that a class is essentially a grouping of data and um, data related functions known as methods. And the data model methods defined in the class control the behavior of a built-in function or operator. So when you're using the class, you're going to use the operator. However, if you're looking through the class, you're going to find the data model method defined. So another numeric data type is the Boolean or the bool. And we can have a look at its directory. And if we go ahead and rearrange this, and compare it to the identifiers in the integer class, we can see that they're essentially identical 
Okay, so I need to unfold the code on the left. And then I can view these two classes side by side. And we can see that the identifiers are identical. Now, if we have a look at the method resolution order of the Boolean, we can see that it's based on the integer, which is based on the object. And if we have a look at its help, we can essentially see um, that this is described in a bit more detail. So the Boolean class has a small number of methods defined in it. So this changes the behavior of the Boolean class. And then notice that all of these are inherited from the integer class. And this means when any of these methods are used, the Boolean class is going to behave identically to an integer because it's using the instructions in the integer class. We can also have a look at the floating point number class or float class, which is essentially a number that has a um, decimal point. And if we have a look at the method resolution order for the float class, we can see it's based upon an object. However, if we have a look at its data model identifiers and compare them to an integer, we can see that they're very similar. And this is because both classes are set up to be consistent to one another. And the consistency of the methods in the three classes is important because they interoperate with one another. So you might use a method in the integer class and return a Boolean value or a floating point number. And you might use a method in the floating point class which will return an integer number or a Boolean number and so on. So we can once again use help to get an overview about all the identifiers in the float class. So once again, I'm just going to create a list with a multi-line string and copy and paste this output. So I can use code folding and I've quickly got all the documentation to the left hand side. And now let's have a look at using numeric data types. So notice if we assign the number 100 to the variable num, it's displayed as an integer in the variable explorer and the same with 10 and 1. Now if we assign 100 dot to num, notice that its type is now a float. And the same with 1.1 and the same with 0 0.1. So the last three numbers have a decimal point and the first three numbers don't. Now recall when we type in num dot followed by a tab, we view the identifiers. And if we type in num dot followed by two tabs, we see the data model identifiers. However, if we type in 100 dot followed by a tab, then this dot is recognized as a decimal point and not an instruction to view the identifiers. So we can put the number in parenthesis and then type in dot and then press tab. And if we assign the value true to num, we notice it's a boolean and the same for false. So let's now have a look at how very small numbers are represented. So here I'm just using string concatenation plus string replication. And I'm essentially going from a very small number in units of 10 just to see how the number is displayed as a string. So now I'm just going to cast each of these strings to a float. And it will use the default representation. So notice when it gets small enough, uh, we use scientific notation. And we can do the same for large numbers. So this is printing the string. And if we cast a string to a float, we can see that once the number gets big enough, it once again uses scientific notation. Okay, so let's have a look at scientific notation. So we've got a number that's much greater than a unit. And what we're essentially going to do is divide it by 10 until it's equivalent to a unit. And notice that we divided this by 10 two times. So our exponent's going to be plus two and our 
Mantissa is essentially going to be this value calculated after division by 10. So what we are doing is essentially dividing by 10 twice, and we're going to times this by 10 to the power of the exponent. So basically we're multiplying this by one. And we use this form, Mantissa, E exponent. And there should be no spaces between this. So notice before the E was white because it was recognized as a variable, but now with no spaces, it's recognized as part of the number. So for a number much smaller than zero, what we're going to do is multiply it by 10 until it's equivalent to a unit. And this time the exponent's going to be minus four because we multiplied four times. And the matisa is going to be the value that we calculated after multiplication by 10. So here, what we can see is that we've times it by 10 multiple times. And we see if we times this by 10 to the, the exponent, which is negative in this case, that we get the result one. So we're multiplying the number by one, which leaves it unchanged. So we use the form mantisa e exponent, and there's no spaces, and we, we get the original number. Because these numbers are built-in numbers, they are normally instantiated without explicit use of the class. And the class itself is essentially used as a casting function. So if we have a look at the directory of the int class, we see we've got the data model identifiers int, bool, float. So if we cast a float to an int, notice that we just truncate anything past a decimal point. So there's no concept of rounding. The int of 3.99 is going to be 3, for example. And one of the things to know when working with a floating point number is that you might not get the precise mathematics that you expect. So we represent the number in a base of 10 and that's how we're used to seeing numbers, but we store them in the computer using a base of two, um, which recall is binary. So I'm going to import pickle and I'm going to dump this number 0.2 to a byte string. And recall that we can use the hexadecimal method to view the byte string in hexadecimal. So this byte string is actually a bit more complicated because the data has been serialized and it's set up for transmission um, over a serial port, so there's checks to make sure what's being transmitted so you don't get incomplete transmission. So there's essentially a prefix and a suffix, and if we want the actual data, then we're going to need to index into this. So now that we have the hex data that we want, let's have a look at it in binary. So I'm going to cast this to an integer using a base of 16, so hexadecimal uses 16, and then I'm going to use the binary function to cast this into a binary string. So next, I want to just get rid of this prefix, 0b, and I want to make sure that all 64 bits are shown. So this is what the float looks like when it's stored on your computer. So the first bit, which we call is at index zero, is the sign. The next 11 bits are the biased exponent. And then the, the rest of the bits are the mantisa. So one thing that's quite common in a mantisa is essentially recursion. So the same sequence occurs multiple times and is not encoded precisely. So eventually the mantisa runs out of bits and something gets truncated. And this results in the rounding errors that you see when you use a float. So essentially, if the sign bit is zero, the sign is going to be positive. Otherwise, it's going to be negative if it's one. So in this case, you can see the sign is positive. And now let's have a look at the biased exponent. So we see this as a binary string, um, but we don't have the zero B. So let's add this. And then we're going to cast this into an integer 
and we've got data that's base two that was in binary. So we see that this is 1020. So the offset of 1023 is used. So essentially any positive or negative value that we encode is, is positive. So if we just subtract this offset, then we're going to get the unbiased exponent. And in this case, we can see it's minus three. So we can have a look at this unbiased exponent in binary. So we see this is essentially the binary equivalent of three with the negative sign in front of it. So let's now have a look at Zim and Tisa. So the one thing to note is that we're missing essentially this one point. And this is because it's a constant for all binary numbers. So we don't encode it to a bit just to save memory which means that we can have a higher dynamic range. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this prefix that's missing. So it should be 0b1, not 0x1. I've made a mistake here. Um, let me try and fix this. So this is index 1, it should be b. Um, let me just recreate this. Okay, so we have this now in binary. So let's now have a look at the sign, the mantisa and the unbiased exponent all in binary. And if you have a look at the mantisa in particular, you can see that values appear to repeat. So you've got this 100, 1100, 1100, 1100. And essentially you're carrying on this operation until you run out of bits and then you you essentially have to truncate it. So this leads to some sort of rounding error and we've seen this when we use floating point numbers. So quite often the signs expressed in the same form, the, the power is essentially expressed as a unbiased exponent in integer form, base 10. And the mantisa is expressed in hexadecimal. So what I'm going to do is just create a hexadecimal string and I'm going to remove the prefix 0x and add the prefix 0x1 dot because recall because recall the one dot isn't stored and so we need to, to include it. So we essentially have the sign, the mantisa and the power in, in the following form. And this is essentially the form that we use for scientific notation in binary. So recall that scientific notation looks like this. So we use P instead of E and the form otherwise is very similar. So if we have a look at the directory of the float class, we can see we've got this from hexadecimal class method. And a class method means it's called from the class. And in this case, it creates a new instance. So it's an alternative constructor. So if we use the from hex class method from the, the float class and supply the above in the correct form, then we get the float 0 0.2, which was the floating point number that we started with. And we have the complementary um, instance method. So an instance method always has self here. Hexadecimal, which will return this, this string. So notice when we have the hexadecimal form of 0 0.2 and 0 0.1 that we've got essentially recurring values. And when you've got recurring values, i.e. it's not ending in 0, 0, 0, 0, you've essentially got some sort of rounding error because you've only got a limited number of bits to store the number in. So the formal and informal string representation for um, integer float and boolean value is essentially identical.
So you can see we've essentially got the same string returned when we use wrapper and string on the following numbers. So each number also has this format data model method. And the format data model method defines the behavior of the number within a formatted string. And recall that we can use an F string for short. So we use braces to insert a variable and then we use a colon and then we've got a format specifier. So for a decimal integer, we can use D and we can prefix this with the, the width of the string. So if we want it to take five characters, we can use five. And if we want to show the leading zeros, we can put a zero in front of this. So if instead we use C to represent the number, what we're going to do is find the character that corresponds to um, the number's ordinal value. So for example, if we have a look at the number 1, 97, and number 2, 945, and use the character function, we get A and alpha respectively. So if we use the format specifier for num1, um, we get the character A, and for num2, we get the character alpha. We can also represent the number uh, in binary using B. So re recall that we can use the binary function to display a number in binary. And quite often you're going to want to display 8 bits for a single byte or 16 bits for 2 bytes. And you might want to display the prefix 0B or not display it depending on the situation. So notice that the prefix 0B um, counts as a character width. So if you want 16 bits, you're going to need to specify a character width of 18 if you've got the prefix enabled. So we can also use X for hexadecimal. So here we can express number one in hexadecimal and we can express it with the prefix. So it's two hexadecimal values and with the prefix, there's two characters for the prefix. So we've got a width of four. If we have a look at number two, then we're going to have four bits. And if we want the zero, we can display this. And if we want the prefix, then we're going to need to select a width of six. If we use capital X instead of small x, then we're going to see everything in uppercase. However, in general, it's not recommended to use uppercase because you want to match Python's default representation, which it uses lowercase. And also, hexadecimal is supposed to be as readable, human readable as possible, and the uppercase variants um, can get transcribed with characters. So we can also view a floating point number and we can view it in the fixed format. So that's the form without the scientific notation. So once again, we've got the character width, and then after the decimal point, what we have is the precision. And if we prefix it with zero, we're going to display the leading zeros. So notice that the decimal point is included in the character width. So here, the character width of 10, you've got five characters before the decimal point, then the decimal point itself, and then four characters after. And we've got four characters after because we specified a precision of four. So we've also got the form with the scientific notation, and we use E here. And generally you would specify the width and also the precision. So remember the width is also going to include the the decimal point, the E, and then the sign of the E, and any of the values in the sign. The precision is going to be the numbers after the decimal point. And if you prefix it with zero, you're going to see leading zeros. This is less common with this number format. 
If we use uppercase E, then we're going to view the exponent using an uppercase E. However, this isn't recommended because we want to be consistent to Python's um, formal representation, which uses the lowercase e by default. And g is the general format, which is the way the number is typically dis displayed. So if it's in a range of powers below or above a unit, essentially, it's displayed using the fixed format. And if it's way smaller or, or way larger, it's going to use the scientific notation. And you've got the general variant with uppercase G, which is essentially the same, but we'll use uppercase E for the scientific notation. And a number can be expressed as a percent using the percentage sign. So what the percentage does is it multiplies it by 100 and then displays the percentage sign after it. So let's discuss order of magnitude. Let's take the radius of hydrogen. So it's 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10. And let's compare this with, say, a human. Let's just say a human has a radius of around a meter. And let's also take the radius of the sun. So this is absolutely massive compared to us. And I forgot the assignment operator. So we can view these three numbers in the Variable Explorer. And just so we can see them side by side, I'm going to use the following fixed format specifier. So essentially, I'm going to use a width of 24, show the trailing zeros, and use a precision of 12 after the decimal point. So let's have a look at these three numbers. So you can see that's tiny, that's around a unit, and this is massive. Now let's have a look at adding a massive unit to a tiny unit. Notice that the massive unit doesn't change. So if you think of this as a practical application and you've got the radius of the sun and you add a tiny hydrogen um, atom to it, you're not going to notice the difference because the error of the radius of the sun is um, leaps and bounds larger than the radius of the hydrogen atom. So addition and subtraction of the small number from the large number essentially won't change the larger number. However, if you do an operation such as division, you might get physical quantity such as the number of hydrogen atoms along the radius of the sun. So we can have a look at these numbers and just kind of visualize how the calculations made. So basically you use the mantissa and the power separately and you calculate the result from these. So if we take the mantissa and in this case we divide one from the other and we take the exponents and in this case we take away one from the other, and that's how we get the result. So that was an example of division. Let's have a look at multiplication now. So we're essentially just going to reverse this calculation. So we're going to do, multiply the number of hydrogens by the radius of hydrogen, and this will give us this radius of, of the sun. And now, what we're going to see is if we take the mantisas and multiply them and we take the exponents and add them, then that's essentially how we get this, this result. So although the, the floating point number, it has an inaccuracy because it's only encoded to a certain number of bits, this um, inaccuracy is normally not substantial compared to the error that a physical number is going to be measured in. So floating points are generally used for most calculations in physics. So there are some operations in Python which will require a whole number or integer and will not work with a float. So one of the data model methods you see for integer but not for float is index. And this means it can be used to index into a collection such as a string.
Notice that if you try to use a float, you're going to get this type error. And you'll get this type error um, with any float, so even one point um, it will still give you this type error because the operation's not supported. Let's have a look at these unitary data model methods. So they don't require any additional data apart from the instance data. So positive will leave a number unchanged and negative will change the sign. And these are normally used by the operators, plus and minus. Now we discussed that a bool is a subclass of the string and it uses the string methods for positive and negative. So if we have a look at the positive value for false, we get zero. And if we have a look at the positive value for true, we get one. So this means that a Boolean value of false is essentially equivalent to zero if an integer operation is used. And a Boolean value of true is equivalent to one if an integer operation is used. So you can see this if you have a look at plus false, plus true, so you get zero and one. If you have a look at minus false, then you're going to get zero. Uh, it's signs change, so negative zero and zero are the same. And if you have a look at negative true, then you get minus times one, so that gives you minus one. A number can be inverted using the invert method. So the inverted number is essentially the number that sums with it to give um, negative one. And if you invert the number that was inverted, then you will return with the original number. The absolute function will retrieve the, the absolute value of the number, so essentially it strips the sign. Let's now have a look at a binary data model method. So it essentially operates on the instance self and interacts with the instance value, and then you get a result. So for example, if we have a look at instance one, this is the instance self, and then we add this to the instance value, um, we get return value of three. And the data model method add controls the behavior of the add operator. Notice that there's also this reverse add. So this would be two plus one from the perspective of one, taking one to be self. So notice that if we add an integer to a floating point number, we get a floating point number. Now, if we try and use the data model method from the integer, we can see that it's not implemented. So what this means is that we actually use the method defined in the float class. So in this case, it would be reverse add. So normally when you see the reverse operator in the class, it means that the operation can support um, two different instances from two different classes. So for example, in this case, you're adding an integer to a, a floating point number. So if we have a look at result of two plus one, we can see we've got an integer. If we have a look at result of two plus 3.14, we can see we've got a float. And this is because the float method reverse add has been used. And if we add an integer to a Boolean value, then we see we get an integer because the Boolean is essentially treated as an integer and uses the integer data model methods in this operation. If we add a float to a Boolean value, we're going to get a float. And recall, if we wanted an integer or a Boolean, then we would just use the um, class as a casting function. And when casting an uh, int or a float to a bool, only zero is false. Any non-zero value, positive or negative or, or tiny, is true. So the integer class has some identifiers that don't really make much sense to use with the integer class and are just there for consistency with the float class. 
So they are generally used in the float class to determine if the floating point number corresponds to an, an integer and um, to round it appropriately if it's not. So you've got is integer and it's going to tell you if the floating point number corresponds to an integer uh, giving the boolean true or false. As integer ratio will give the floating point number as an integer ratio. So for example, 0 0.5 has a ratio 1, 2. Um, but this may work as unexpected because of the re recurring rounding errors. So you may get like two ma massively huge numbers. So we've got the six comparison operators and numbers are ordinal. So we can use all six of them on numbers. So we can check if 0 is equal to 1, is 0 not equal to 1, if 1 is equal to 1. We can check if 0 is equal to false and we can see this is true and we can check if 1 is equal to true and we can see this is true. So this is because the boolean value false is equivalent to 0 and the boolean value true is equivalent to 1 and when the comparison operators are used the instructions are followed from the integer class directly. So we can see if 0 is greater than 1, if 0 is less than 1, and we can use the word OR to combine conditions. So we can see is 0 equal to 1 or 0 is equal to 0. So one of these conditions is true, so we get true. If we see 0 is greater than 1 or 0 is equal to 1, then we get false because none of these conditions are true. And we can combine the operations greater than and equal to with the greater than or equal to operator. We've also got the less than or equal to operator. So instead of using or, we can use and, and this is only going to result in true when both the conditions are true. So you can be a bit smarter and combine conditions together. So if you have a look at 2 is less than 3 and 3 is less than 5, then you can combine um, these two operations together in the same way. And notice you get the same result, which is true. Care should be taken when um, evaluating expressions using comparison operators for order of precedence. So here we've got is 3 equal to 1 plus 2. So the plus operator takes precedence over the comparison operator. However, if we put pre um, parenthesis around the 3 is equal to 1 and then add 2, then we're going to get 2. So we're essentially evaluating is 3 equal to 1 and this is false and then we're adding 2. So this is 0 plus 2. Notice that you may get unexpected results using comparison operators with floating point numbers and this is due to the rounding errors commonly found in floating point numbers. So 0 0.3 is not equal to 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 and you can see the difference when you have a look at 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 and compare it to 0 0.3. So we have the round function which can be used to round a uh, floating point number to a uh, specified number of digits and then you can use the comparison operator and it works as expected. Note that you may need to use the round function on both sides of the comparison operator. So we've also got the truncation function, the floor function and the ceiling function and these are less commonly used so they're um, compartmentalized into the math module. So if you imagine integers as ceilings and floors, then floor is going to take the floating point numbers integer that's on the floor and ceiling is going to take the floating point numbers integer that's on its ceiling. And truncation is just going to truncate anything past a decimal point, which is the same as casting it to an int. It's maybe just more clear from the terminology. So you can see some of the differences when you're using negative numbers. So remember, you're just kind of conceptualizing 
a ceiling and a floor and if you're below ground then you've got the floor level below ground and the ceiling below ground. Okay, so we've already had a look at add, so let's now have a look at subtract. And if you try and use subtract between an integer and a floating point number, you see it's not implemented. And this operation can be carried out because the reverse subtract is implemented in the floating point number. So we can use this to subtract one number from another. We can use multiply to multiply one number by the other. We can use to the power of to raise a number to another power. So 3.14 to the power of 2 is the equivalent of 3.14 times 3.14. 3.14 to the power of 3 is the equivalent of 3.14 times 3.14 times 3.14. So we can perform integer division, and integer division has a remainder. So we, we get this remainder, um, which is also known as a modulus, using the modulus operator. We also have the divide modulus function, which essentially returns these two values within a tuple. We also have the true divide operator, which returns a floating point number. So the remainder is essentially expressed as a fraction after the decimal point. And notice in the case of 4 through divided by 2, you get 2.0. So this is still a float, even though it's a whole number. Let's now have a look at PEDMAS. So this is an abbreviation for parenthesis, exponentiation, division, multiplication, addition, or subtraction. So basically, you can change the order of precedence by using um, parenthesis. So in the top case, you done 2 to the power of 3 first because exponentiation took precedence over multiplication. If you added parenthesis around this, then you could do 5 times 2 first to get 10 and then raise this to the power of 3 to get 1000. So the integer class has the attributes numerator and denominator, which are there for compatibility with the fractions class, which is found within the fractions module. So for an integer, the numerator is always going to be the value of the integer, and the denominator is always going to be 1. So you can conceptualize 2 as being equal to 2 divided by 1. So if we have a look at the directory of the fraction class, we can see that it's set up for numeric co compatibility with the integer class. And if we just rearrange the identifiers, we can see we've got the object-based identifiers. And then we've got many of the identifiers seen in the integer class, although it's a smaller subset of them because there's less operations supported with fractions than there, there is with integers. And uh, identifiers beginning with a single underscore are essentially used internally within the fraction class and aren't used by the user, so you can pretty much ignore these. So we need to use the fraction class to instantiate a fraction instance. And in order to do so, we need to express a numerator and a denominator. And the formal and informal string representation for this class differ. So the formal representation, when you print it out, you're going to essentially get what you need to input to create an instance. If you use the string representation, then you've got this shorthand form for a fraction, which is similar to how you would view it in mathematics. So because we've got the data model method add available, and it's set up for compatibility with the integer class, we can essentially add a fraction to an integer and we can use the float class as a casting function to cast it to a float. Now if we perform addition with a float then any fraction instance and integer instance is going to be cast into a float so the resulting value will be a float. So we can multiply a fraction by an integer and this will give us a fraction. And if we raise um, 
integer to the power over fraction, we're essentially going to cast this into a float. Some of our operations, such as integer division, will still give us an integer. However, the modulus associated with it will generally be a fraction. And notice, um, because this was essentially whole, this is, is zero, and it's just rounded down to its simplest form, giving a denominator of one. So the attributes real and imaginary, along with the method conjugate, are for compatibility with the complex class. So the complex class has a real and imaginary component, and the imaginary component was defined um, using the square root of minus one. So if you have a look at minus one to the power of 0 0.5, you essentially get zero plus one times this imaginary component. Now we can split this to the real and imaginary component separately. And if we just go ahead and round the real component to six decimal places, we see that this is effectively zero. And what we see is the kind of rounding error inherent in the float class. So the complex class has a real and an imaginary component. And we can have a look at the directory of the complex class. The integer class and the floating point class have the imaginary and real attributes. The real attribute is essentially the value of the float and the imaginary attributes zero just for compatibility with the complex class. So if we have a look at the initialization signature of the complex class, notice that we essentially require two integer values one for the real component and one for the imaginary component. And notice that there's the shorthand form, which is 2 plus 1 jai, and there's no spaces here, and they are generally included in parentheses just to emphasize um, the fact that they're grouped together. So you don't want to add spaces, and generally you want to um, include the parentheses around them just to emphasize that they're together. So you can have a look at the formal representation and the informal representation, and you can see it's consistent for this class. So recall that the definition for jai was the square root of minus one. So if you do zero plus one jai times zero plus one jai, then you should get minus one and no imaginary component. So for addition and subtraction, you essentially just treat the real and imaginary components separately. So you perform addition and subtraction of the real component and addition and subtraction of the imaginary components, and then you combine them together. So in this case, you've got five and its real component is five and its imaginary component is zero. And you can multiply or divide by an integer and you, you're just essentially carrying this operation on each each of the components. When you multiply one complex number by another complex number you essentially need to algebraically um, calculate them out so this would be 1 plus 3 j minus 3 j minus 9 j squared but remember that the definition of j was that j squared equals minus one. So this would be one um, minus minus nine, which would sum up to give 10. And this number that we use to multiply this is known as the complex conjugate and essentially can be used with the complex number when multiplied together to get the magnitude. If we have a look at the int class, we can see there's a number of methods for compatibility with a bytes instance. And so the integer has the class method um, from bytes, and this is an alternative constructor, uh, which can be used to construct an uh, integer instance from a byte string. So recall from the previous video that a byte is essentially an integer ranging from between zero to 256, inclusive of zero and exclusive of 256. So the highest value it can have is 255. And recall that 
you've essentially got the ordinal value of a character. So in this case, the ordinal value of A is 97 and B is 98. So we can use the hexadecimal function to express this integer in hexadecimal form. And notice that we've got this OX, which means it's in hexadecimal, and we can use this um, in a bytes in replacing the O with a left slash, which means insert the escape character. And if the escape character is a printable ASCII character, then it's represented by that ASCII character. If it's out with the ASCII range or it's non-printable, you're just going to see it represented by this escape sequence. So we can use this integer um, class method from bytes to create an integer instance from one of these byte strings. So here you see that we've got the integer 97 returned. And so this works as expected. We've also got the instance method two bytes, which can be used to cast an integer from the appropriate range to a bytes instance. So if we have a look at the ordinal value of a non-ASCII character, such as alpha, we get the value 945, which is greater than the maximum value of a byte 255. So what this means is this value is encoded using multiple bytes. And if we have a look at its hexadecimal form, then we, we see that we get more than two characters. And in this case, we've got three characters. So remember, it's two, two characters per byte. So in this case, we're going to need two bytes. So 0, 3, and B1. And if we use the integers alternative constructor from bytes with this bytes instance, then we return the value 945 as expected. So we've got a number of other byte related identifiers, which don't really make too much sense unless you visualize the integer in essentially binary. So let's have a look at bit length and bit count. So let's just go from hexadecimal and have a look at the bit length. So if we view this in binary what, and remove the 0b prefix, we're essentially calculating the length of this. And we see that the length is 7 because there's 7 characters here. If we have a look at the bit count, what we are essentially is summing the number of these bits that are 1. So we can have a look at the data model method AND. So let's have a look at this hexadecimal value and this other hexadecimal value. So recall the default representation for um, integer is in decimal, so let's just use the hexadecimal function to view this in the hexadecimal. The AND data model method controls the behavior of the AND operator, so if we use this we get the same result. So this doesn't really make sense until you look at each of these values in binary. So what I'm going to do is view these in binary and remove the prefix and set the zero fill to eight. And I'm just going to view these three numbers side by side. So we had OX61, OX62, and the result was OX60. So basically where both of the values were one, we get one in the result. And where either of the values were zero, we get zero in the result. And we can view this result in hexadecimal or in decimal. But to understand the operation, you need to see it in binary. So now we can have a look at the data model method OR. And once again, the results expressed in decimal, so we can view this in hexadecimal. And this controls the behavior of the OR operator. 
And once again, to understand this, we need to view the result in binary. So it's essentially when either one of the values is a one or both of them are one, then we um, get a one in the result. So we can view this as a hex string or we can view this as a decimal integer. We can have a look at the method exclusive or. So once again, this returns the decimal um, value three, and we can have a look at its hex value, which is um, zero three. So this controls the behavior of the exclusive or operator, and it shouldn't be confused with the power to um, in some other programming languages, such as MATLAB, um, this is used for the power of. So to understand the above operation, we need to have a look at this in binary. So essentially, only when the two bits are different do you get one in result. If they match, then you get zero in the result. And we can have a look at the result in hexadecimal, and we can have a look at it in decimal, respectively. So one thing you should know is that the AND or OR data model methods map to the AND or OR operators. They do not map to the AND or OR keywords. So if we have a look at using AND between two integer instances, so if one of the integer instances is zero, you're going to return zero. Both of them is zero, you're going to return zero. And if both of them are deemed as true values, so if they're cast to a bool, they're true, then you're going to return the value on the right. So two and three will give you three because three is on the right. So recall that a Boolean value of an empty string is, is false. And the Boolean value of a non-empty string is, is true. So this can also be used with strings. So because the string is false, then essentially the zero value has been returned. And if we type in by and hello, then hello will be returned because both of these are deemed as being true. So let's now have a look at or in comparison. So we've got zero or three. And because one of these values is true, then it will be returned. And if we do two or zero, then because one of these values is returned, it will be returned. And if we do two or three, because the first value is, is true, it's going to be returned. And if we do zero and zero, then zero will be returned because neither are true. So if we do the empty string and hello, then hello will be returned. And if we do by or hello, then the, the first value by will be returned. So if we go to the help of the bool class, notice that we've got methods defined here and we've essentially got and or an x or um, defined in the boolean class. So they behave a bit differently. So true and true is true. Notice that true and true is also true. False and true is false. False and true is false. True and false is false. True and false is false. False and false is false. False and false is false. So basically the keywords and the operator are consistent for the bool class. So if we do true or true, it's true. True or true, it's true. False or true, it's true. False or true, it's true. True or false is true. True or false is true. False or false is false. False or fo false is false. And for x or the two values need to be different. So true, x or true is false. And there's no keyword x or. And 
So we can have a look at false, XOR false, and this is also false. But true, XOR false is true, and false, XOR true is true. We can also invert the Boolean, um, and although it says that this operation has been defined in the, the Boolean class, it essentially has the same behavior as it does in the integer class. So true's um, taken to be the value 1, and 1 minus 2 is minus 1, so the inverse is minus 2. And we see that the formal representation is also redefined in the bool class, and that's why we type in true and false instead of 0 and 1. We also have this right shift and left shift. So let's just take a value in hexadecimal and we're going to right shift it to using one place. So the right shift data model method controls the behavior of the right shift operator. And to understand this method, we basically need to see the integer in binary form. So I'm going to view it in binary form and I'm going to remove the 0b prefix and then I'm going to zero fill it to 16 places and now I'm going to right shift it by 1, 2 and 3 places. And if we have a look at the result then you can see what's essentially happened is that we've got one more zero to the right and everything's been shunted away. So basically that one that was at the end is now shoved out and then the zero at the end shoved out and then the zero at the end shoved out and the zero at the end shoved out. Let's now have a look at the left shift and we can see that it moves to the left so we essentially add a zero there and shift everything over. So we can just have a look at the value OX B31 and we can left shift this um, by one place. So when you view this in hexadecimal or in decimal form, the operation um, won't make sense. But when you view it in binary, it's more intuitive and you can see what's going on. So recall that when we use a floating point number that we essentially have this rounding error because we view the number in decimal um, but we encode it in binary. Now there's actually a decimal class which behaves the same way that a decimal number does. And here we need to instantiate it using a string of the number that we want. So notice that the decimal of 0.1 plus 0.2 is the decimal of 0.3 as expected. So notice that we also need to instantiate this using a string of the number that we want. If we use a float, then we're going to basically inherit the, um, the rounding precision um, of the float and lose the additional accuracy um, intended by this module. So although we're going to have um, less recursive rounding errors due to encoding in binary, we will occasionally see the recursive rounding errors that are inherent in the decimal system, such as 10 divided by 3, which um, basically has this recurring 3 and never encodes um, precisely down to, to, to a trailing number of zeros. And this is because we've only got 10 digits to encode a number, so the problem's less prevalent than in binary, but it still occurs from time to time. So let's have a look at the directory of identifiers for the decimal class. So we can see that it's largely consistent with the float class. So if we view the identifiers side by side, then we can can see that they're consistent. However, we see that the um, decimal class has essentially some different conversion uh, methods, and then it's got a lot of additional methods at the bottom.
So you can get more details about these by using the help. So we'll just add this um, to, the, to the script on the left hand side, just for the sake of completion. So the help will give a description of what all these additional methods do. Now, a lot of these methods in the decimal class are found compartmentalized in the math module. So we can have a look at the directory of the math module as well. So the math module contains common mathematical operations, similar to the operations you would find on a calculator. So I'm just going to group them in a certain way that makes a bit more sense. And if you use help on the module, you're going to find documentation which describes each of these functions. So I'm going to finish here and I'll cover the math module in a separate video. I want to review collections first um, because you need to have some basic knowledge of collections before you go looking at some of the mathematical functions. So essentially, I'm going to cover collections in the next video, and then I'm going to go back and review the math module in a video after.